Okay, hi, we're gonna talk about what I would do if I had cancer. Uh, first picture here is of a patient undergoing chemotherapy with the IV infusing there. And of course, it's always sad when a person has cancer and they have to undergo chemo. And I always feel sorry for them, you know, you wanna help them. But at the same time, there's something new in my mindset is that I sometimes also think, does this patient really need chemo? That thought never used to cross my mind in the past, but it does cross my mind now. My mother died of cancer, you know, that was a long time ago. It was about 25 years ago, and I really didn't know that much about cancer at that time. I just learned what I learned in med school and residency. Um, and my mom did overall pretty well. She made it 12 years when she's only expected to live two. And the oncologist was very good to her, and so was the oncologist's wife. They, helped really, they came to our house to help take care of her. But anyways, um, be that as it may, I'm going to go into a lot of the physiology of cancer here. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, and first of all, disclaimer, I'm not a cancer doctor. I am not a cancer researcher. I do not take care of cancer patients in terms of I don't guide their treatment or any of that sort of thing. I have done over a thousand biopsies and I've done plenty of other procedures on cancer patients. Um, my job, I primarily work as a body radiologist, neuroradiologist, and I still do some procedures, not much. Okay, I am not recommending the ideas in this video to anyone. I'm simply sharing with you some ideas about cancer that provide thoughts for future research. And the kind of approach that I take is, is takes a lot of self-discipline, reading, exercise, and most people, there's no way they'd be willing to do all that. Um, I've also noticed, you know, back in the 1800s, people would read 900-page read novels. Nowadays, to get anybody to read anything is pretty difficult. Okay, so what is cancer? Cancer is a cell that proliferates out of control. It's a cell that's de-differentiated. To differentiate means to become part of a multicellular organism and function within an organ system, like to be a liver cell, a lung cell, a kidney cell, which requires a lot of specialization and it requires a lot of energy. You need aerobic metabolism to make all those ATPs so you can carry out the function of a kidney cell or a liver cell. When a cancer cell starts to grow, it's, it's like an anaerobic bacteria. It's de-differentiated into a primitive form of life, enabling it to function with much less ATP production, and it focuses simply on replicating itself. It sort of no longer cares about being part of a team within the kidney or the liver and just wants to replicate itself and try to move to a location which would be more favorable for its growth. The standard stages of cancer are number one, tumor initiation, which is a change in the DNA, like a mutation, for example, or an injury to a mitochondria that's going to get the cell to grow out of control. But just because a mutation has occurred in a cell, the vast majority of them never grow, never go anywhere. So that's tumor initiation and the initial injury. The next part is tumor promotion. And here's where the tumor starts to grow. And this is really a key point because everybody's been exposed to some tumor initiators in the past. You can't change that, but you can dramatically lower your exposure to tumor promoters. And that's really, I think, the best strategy. Sort of animal protein is the ultimate tumor promoter. And that was described in great detail by the great book, uh, The China Study by T. Colin Campbell. Um, tumor metastases is spread to distant sites. And that's the main reason why patients die. You know, you get brain metastases, lung metastases, liver metastases. Those often cause a patient to die. And bone metastases can be a big deal to the spine. If you get a compression fracture, it compresses the spinal cord. That's relatively uncommon, but it does happen. Um, so if you could prevent metastases, that would dramatically improve your survival. And the other thing is, unfortunately, a lot of times at the time of initial diagnosis, there are metastatic foci. They're maybe not clinically detectable yet, but quite often they are present. Some people believe they're almost always present by the time a uh, primary cancer can be diagnosed. The next thing is we'll talk briefly about the TNM staging system for cancer. That's T for tumor, N for nodes, for lymph nodes, M for metastases. Okay, so if you just had a, a big tumor, that might be a T3 with no lymph nodes, N0, no mets, M0. Okay, what are the standard treatments for cancer? The most standard conventional treatments are surgery and radiation for local control of the tumor. Those are just done on a primary tumor typically. Chemotherapy is typically given for metastatic disease because it goes throughout the body. Um, there's some special indications whereby radiation might be used for treatment of metastases in some locations, sometimes for brain metastases, sometimes for spine metastases, and there's some other situations. And so now the question arises for this video, what would I do if I had cancer? 
Okay, well, first of all, my situation is pretty unique. I've seen many thousands of cancers on CAT scans and MRIs and whatnot. So most of the time when I look at, let's see, a CAT scan of the chest or something, I could tell if it's cancer, but I cannot tell what subtype it is. For example, lung cancer could be a lot of different types of lung cancer. Well, about five main types. Um, and if you're going to give chemotherapy or if you're going to give radiation therapy, you definitely want to get a biopsy first so you can be as close to 100% certain dairy certainty before you initiate treatment. In addition, um, sometimes you can test for mutations or special types of receptors on the tumor, like let's say an estrogen uh, receptor positive or negative breast cancer or other mutations that can be indicators of prognosis, can be indicators of what type of chemotherapy to choose. Is, are they more likely to benefit from? There's specific subtypes of breast cancer that do much better than others with regard to chemotherapy. Um, so, but the question is, would I do a biopsy? And I think for a standard patient, a biopsy is a very good, very helpful standard thing to do. However, for myself, I would already know it's cancer. And if I'm going to initially just, you know, go on a strict vegan diet and stuff, I don't need to know it. So why bother with the biopsy? Could it potentially spread from a biopsy? That's very, very, very rare. But if I don't have to biopsy something, then I won't do it. Um, what about surgery? Would I get surgery? It depends. I mean, if you have a bowel obstruction, you're going to need surgery to bypass the obstruction, and I want to be able to eat. Um, also, in another location, I would ask myself, is the surgery going to dramatically improve 5 or 10-year survival, like by 30% or more? Um, if it's only a 5 to 10% improvement, I would probably refuse because 5 or 10%, any type of research study is going to tend to promote the treatment, whatever it is, and it's going to tend to downplay the side effects. So something that tells you only a 5 or 10% improvement, that's so minimal, and you know the side effects are going to be very real from whatever it is, um, that I wouldn't do it, not in that context. What about chemo? Again, it depends on the survival. If there's a big improvement in survival, let's say a 30% increased 10-year survival, that would be reasonable. But if there's only a small improvement in survival, you know there's going to be a lot of side effects, like immune suppression, potentially fatigue and brain fog, then why do it? Patients that have a new diagnosis of cancer are typically sent to a hematologist-oncologist. And so there's a tendency, the philosophy of medicine in this country is always do the most you can, which sometimes that's good, but a lot of times it's not. You know, sometimes it's best to just do nothing initially, try to understand the situation better, and then gradually come to a conclusion about what you want to do rather than rush into something, especially if there's not a good, solid, strong, proven reason. Okay, but then what about radiation therapy? Well, see, radiation therapy is different than chemo in the sense that the radiation therapy docs like a secondary referral specialty care. They're not going to get sent to radiation on, we call it rad onc, unless there's a pretty good reason. With hemonc, any cancer patient just goes to hemonc. So hemonc will see a lot more patients than rad, rad onc will see. Okay, what causes cancer? Now there's different theories about cancer, but the one that's most impressive and most convincing to my extensive study of the subject is the metabolic theory of cancer. We're going to talk about that more on the next slide, but Otto Warburg uh, won the Nobel Prize in 1931. He showed in tissue culture that when you induce hypoxia, which means decreased oxygen supply by 35% or more, you know, a lot of the cells will die from the lack of oxygen and go into apoptosis, programmed cell death, for example, but sometimes some of the cells will survive the lack of oxygen and be transformed into cancer cells. They'll so de-differentiate and shift from oxygen using aerobic metabolism to anaerobic metabolism without oxygen. Okay, and an interesting point is that mitochondrial dysfunction can cause cancer. High fat diets cause mitochondrial dysfunction and the same populations that eat high fat diets have high rates of cancer. If you look at, the, for example, Japanese and Papua New Guinea, both of them smoked a lot of cigarettes but didn't have that much lung cancer, whereas uh, Americans who smoke the same amount would have much more lung cancer, and that's presumably thought because they're eating a high-fat diet. The high-fat diet is synergistic with the, the carbon monoxide and tobacco smoke to cause worsening tissue hypoxia, and the high cholesterol causing low formation contributes to the tissue hypoxia. So what causes tumor initiation? Of course, you know, we just mentioned a few, smoking tobacco, air pollution, high-fat diets, they all can lead to uh, mutations and other toxic chemicals as well, mutagenic chemicals. 
Uh, what will what do I do about tumor initiation? I just accept the fact we've all been exposed to, we've all got some damaged DNA and our immune system's great at repairing DNA. We've got DNA repair enzymes, tons of them. We have tons of mutations that our body just fixes every day. Okay, and you can't change the past, but um, the big thing you can do is avoid tumor promoters and that's a major thing and it's very doable. Okay, what's the worst tumor promoter? T. Colin Campbell. Uh, wrote the magnificent book China Study and in his experience he was able to take rodents and when he would feed them 20% of calories from animal protein their cancers grew rapidly. When he fed them 5% or less animal protein tumor growth stopped. So the point was the tumor was functioning, the animal protein was functioning as a tumor promoter to get the cancer to grow in the mice. And he had so much confidence in his research when his wife was diagnosed with a melanoma he suggested 100% whole plant diet, whole food plant diet and apparently she did quite well. I don't know all the details of that, none of my business, but he wrote about it in one of his books or his lectures or something, and she did well. And um, we're going to talk some more about some similar experiences other physicians and families and patients have had. Okay, some cancer theories. You've got to have an overall theory to make sense of things. So. An original popular theory was the centripetal theory of cancer, that cancer spreads outward like a sphere from its origin site. And that was back in the days of Halstead around 1900 when he started out doing the mastectomy surgery and then this idea, well, if I just resect more tissue, not just the breast, but also the pectoralis major muscle and the axillary lymph nodes, uh, maybe I can decrease the incidence of recurrence and help the patient to live longer. And so these procedures became quite extensive from the mastectomy to the radical mastectomy to the ultra radical mastectomy and these surgeries are quite disfiguring. It's now been shown that they work no better than a simple lumpectomy which just means take out the breast mass without much more. Um, and we also know that cancer doesn't just spread by growing a bigger primary mass. It gets into the lymphatics and the blood and spreads to distant sites. And once it's spread to distant sites as it usually has, you can't cure it just by a surgical resection of the primary mass. Okay, the most popular cancer theory that's taught to medical students and that seems to be most popular with the oncologists is right here called the somatic mutation theory. And this is also popularized in a very famous book about cancer called The Emperor of All Maladies, A Biography of Cancer by Siddhartha Mukherjee. He's a physician. He did a lot of his training at Harvard and he's a smart guy. It's an entertaining book. But at the same time, I think the book's kind of bogus, and I'll tell you why. Because he only emphasizes the somatic mutation theory, saying that cancer is a genetic disease. And he's basically saying, it's a genetic disease, there's nothing you can do, your only hope is chemo. I'm an oncologist, so let me give you chemo, okay? And yeah, chemo does play a very important role in the treatment of cancer, but there's a lot more to cancer than that. And to only go by chemo is really... Trust me, you're, you'll see if you haven't figured it out already. There's a lot of stuff to be aware of with cancer. And it's not always, chemo's not always the way to go. Quite often, it's not the way to go. Okay, in the entire book, he only gave one paragraph about the potential association of a poor diet with cancer or of a good diet for preventing cancer and improving survival rates. I thought that was irresponsible. He made no mention of Dean Ornish's work on prostate cancer, which was low-grade prostate cancer, but he showed that uh, vegetarian diet uh, helped those patients to maintain a stable PSA. Um, no mention whatsoever of T. Colin Campbell's book, The China Study, and his extensive research you know, for many decades on the effect of animal protein on tumors as well as the effect of uh, removing the animal protein from the diet. Uh, he made no mention of the epidemiology that shows dramatically lower cancer rates in populations eating low-fat plant-based diets. Uh, he made no mention of the numerous cancer survivors, uh, persons like Chris Wark, Ruth Heydrich, Janet Marie Wakelin, and others. No mention of persons like Kelly Turner, Ph.D., who worked at a famous cancer center and noticed there's a lot of survivors of metastatic cancer. And she wrote a book called Radical Remissions where she studied them, which seems like a pretty smart thing to do. If you're individually hoping to survive cancer, it would be smart to study people who survived it. So she wrote a book, Radical Remissions, and I read the book, and I thought it was pretty good. There's some stuff there in there that's a little crazy. She just, you know, wanted to be inclusive, so she would include some ideas that I thought were a little bit nuts. She talked about the, like, nine or so most common things that cancer patients do that's, that have made incredible recoveries, and one of the most common obvious ones is they go on a low-fat plant-based diet. 
And there's a lot of solid physiologic reasons why that's what I would do, among other things. So, um, you know, what tumors respond well to chemo? Childhood leukemias, Hodgkin's lymphoma, some bone cancer, some subtypes of breast cancer, some gastrointestinal stromal tumors, just that's great. But what's not mentioned in the Emperor of All Maladies book is that lots of the most common types of cancers do not respond that well to chemo, has been my reading of the literature. Um, there was a book called The Tripping Over the Truth by Travis Christofferson, where he did a great job of describing the history of the biochemistry that led to uh, better understanding the metabolic theory. On the other hand, Tripping Over the Truth by Christofferson, he then, after saying all this clever, intelligent stuff about the metabolic theory of cancer, he starts thinking about recommending a high-fat, like, high-fat diet, which is just, I thought, incredibly stupid, okay? Trust me, when you've studied the physiology of tissue oxygenation, the last thing in the world I want to do is feed somebody a high-fat diet and drop the oxygen supply to the tissue. No way. And potentially uh, decrease mitochondrial function in a cell. You want to provide a healthy uh, milieu around the tumor, so to speak, to favor the normal cells, which need to run on aerobic oxygen metabolism. Okay, but what were some of the big things from Tripping Over the Truth and other sources and lectures on cancer? Was the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, where they mapped out the DNA sequences of all these different cancers. They were hoping to find a characteristic pattern of mutations to go with individual types of tumor, like a breast cancer, colon cancer, and whatnot, but they did not find that. The pattern of mutations was so chaotic and random that no convincing theory has been able to explain it. And there's some research, like a famous uh, Seafried PhD guy, who basically says it's obvious that cancer is not genetic. You can't explain it with uh, mutations because the mutations are so random and chaotic. And they also point to, they've done cell transplant experiments where they'll take the nucleus of one cell and put it into another cell, like a cancer cell into a non-cancer cell, and that does not cause cancer. But if you take the cytoplasm with the mitochondria and you put that into another cell, that will cause cancer in the new uh, host recipient cell because that's what's causing the cancer, what's going on with the mitochondria and the cytoplasm, not what's going on with the DNA, thus indicating that the DNA is not the money. The DNA is not what's causing the problem. Um, he also points out the research of Peter Peterson, PhD, who figured out that the key change in protein expression in a cancer cell is that they start making a lot more hexokinase 2. So hexokinase 2, we'll just abbreviate it, HK2, and that is a unique enzyme. So that's the enzyme that first phosphorylates glucose when it comes in the cell. So glucose comes in the cell, and you got to phosphorylate it because that puts a big charge on it, a lot of negative charges, and that traps it in the cell so it can't escape back out through the plasma membrane. And once it's been sucked into the cell, you can run it through glycolysis and make some energy out of it real fast. Okay. The other thing that's unique about hexokinase 2, so it's in the cell, it sticks to the mitochondria. So it's, it's waiting for that glucose to grab that glucose but it's stuck to the mitochondria, and it's stabilizing that mitochondrial membrane. Specifically, it's attached to something called the voltage-dependent anion channel. And by stabilizing that mitochondrial membrane, it keeps that cell alive. Because when a cell is exposed to hypoxic conditions, often the cell will die, as we spoke about apoptosis, very typical with decreased oxygen supply to a cell. But once HK2 gets locked down to the mitochondria, the cell resists going into apoptosis. That's another characteristic feature of a cancer cell. Um, one second. Um, doing something here, please. Okay, sorry about that. Um, then the next thing is that um, the DNA mutations appear to be the sequela of hypoxia, not the cause of cell transformation. So that's why the Cancer Genome Atlas, which was specifically designed with the initials of DNA, TG, TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, um, which was done to hopefully prove the genetic theory of uh, cancer, actually disproved it. Um, this was a major refutation of somatic mutation theory. And it's a major support for the metabolic theory of cancer, as suggested all these years ago by Otto Warburg. So here's just showing some things about why do tissues become hypoxic. Typical red blood cells, about 7 microns, a little bit bigger than a typical capillary, about 5 microns. The RBC has to deform to get through it. 
When you've got fat, it sticks the red blood cells together like a stack of coins. That's called rouleau formation, French word for stack of coins. And it makes it harder for these red blood cells to get through the capillaries. And it leads to decreased oxygen uh, receiving the tissues. And when that's severe enough and there's other things superimposed upon it, like vasoconstriction from excess sodium consumption, then excuse me, one will get tissue hypoxia, which can induce cancers. This is just a diagram showing the experiments, primarily of Peter Quo. Uh, Ray Rosenman and Meyer Friedman did some similar work. And what they showed was when you eat a high fat meal with saturated fat, you start getting significant levels of hyperlipidemia, high fat in the blood by about three hours, peaks at about five hours, fades out pretty well by about eight hours. And he did this. He was a cardiologist from Philadelphia, Peter Quo. He did this with coronary artery cardiac angina patients, meaning they get chest pain um, on exertion and uh, or dyspnea, shortness of breath on exertion. And then when they fed them, then there was a big change. And he did this first of all in the 1950s. Then in the 1960s, there was a big push to go with uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, like the vegetable oils, because they thought they caused less of an increase in cholesterol. Therefore, they're probably heart healthy. But it turned out they're just as bad or worse. The PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids from these oils, would cause a much more prolonged sludging of the blood. So they cause even worse uh, problems with oxygen delivery. They're tumor promoters. They're very bad for one's health. And as a matter of fact, I, this is a side topic, but they're toxic to the brain too. I'll talk about that in a future lecture, but yeah, you don't want to be ever ingesting those things. Okay, what about the cancer milieu? So milieu is just the, the medium in which they grow, the area around the cancer cells. And the reason you want to understand this is by understanding the milieu, you can do things to change it, to make it more favorable to the normal cells. Cancer is able to outcompete the neighboring cells in a hypoxic acidotic milieu. The local milieu of cancer cells is partly determined by local factors like the size of the tumor and then also by systemic factors like the person's diet. Excessive salt, meaning sodium chloride, NaCl, can lead to low-grade metabolic acidosis because the chloride anions can displace bicarbonate ions in the blood. The bicarbonate ions, HCO3-, are a pH buffer. Elevated dietary sodium will also lead to issues with the potassium uh, sodium ATPase causing increased cytoplasm calcium and that can lead to insulin resistance and it has a net effect to cause the individual cell in that context to pump more protons into the extracellular matrix. In other words, to make the extracellular matrix more acidic. That favors cancer cell growth. Okay? Um, excessive animal protein can also cause a low-grade metabolic acidosis because the animal protein contains more sulfur um, amino acids like methionine and cysteine and those in their metabolic degradation are converted in part to sulfuric acid. So all of these things, the salt and the animal protein, are contributing to metabolic acidosis. Okay, um, excessive dietary fat leads to tissue hypoxia. The tissue hypoxia favors cancer growth over the neighboring cells and it induces something called HIF, hypoxia inducible factor. And this can lead, uh, while many of the cells die, this can lead to the cells that survive it transforming into anaerobic predominant cells. And these anaerobic predominant cells, as we spoke about a moment ago, have increased hexokinase 2. And that's the big thing that happens. Hexokinase 2 takes over to start phosphorylating glucose as soon as it can get it into the cell. And this is why cancer cells will have tons of this stuff, and they'll use tons of glucose for their metabolism. The hypoxia-inducible factor also increases something called VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor. Vascular endothelial growth factor will cause the ingrowth of new blood vessels into the surrounding milieu. These new blood vessels make it easier for cancer metastasize. So by improving oxygenation of the tissues, you can potentially decrease the VEGF and thus increase prevent the angiogenesis that might favor metastatic disease. Plant-based diets contain a lot more vitamin C, which also helps to decrease the amount of uh, VEGF that gets made in these areas. Um, there's other things that will injure DNA. You know, a sunburn can increase the risk of sun cancer, but <laughs> that's kind of a separate subject. You know, I actually think sunscreens are more dangerous than uh, sunburn. That's a long story, though. And then there's, there's, there's subtle nuance to that, but skin cancers, most of them are not life-threatening. And Sometimes people have skin cancer, they get less of other things, but that's, there's a whole bunch of nuance there we don't have time to go into right now. So let's not, I don't want to belabor those subjects because they're, they're nuanced. All right. Immune suppression. Yeah, immune suppression increases your risk of cancer. So somebody can get a transplant, let's say a kidney transplant, and it might keep them alive a bit longer, but they're at increased risk for cancers. Chronic inflammation 
like with a foreign body with asbestos, which is quite interesting because the asbestos creates an inflammatory reaction that can lead to hypoxia of cells within the inflammatory uh, mass there, and some of those can be transformed into cancer. Um, and that's another question, too, about some of these viral cancers, like is it the virus causing the cancer itself, or is the virus simply inducing a large amount of inflammation, leading to hypoxia of some of the cells within the inflammatory area that then become cancerous because they're hypoxic? Okay, hypoxia is not good. Okay, um, we all know that animal protein increases insulin-like growth factor. It also increases mTOR, uh, mammalian target of rapamycin. Um, now, cancer cells will generate energy primarily through glycolysis, and the end product of glycolysis is pyruvate. It's a three-carbon carboxylic acid, and that then is converted into uh, lactate. And the lactate is acidic, and it's pumped out into the extracellular matrix. So again, it makes the extracellular matrix more acidic, which favors cancer growth. Okay, um, a normal blood cell uh, when it usually metabolizes glucose aerobically, using oxygen. So after the glucose goes through glycolysis, pyruvate is produced. But the pyruvate, instead of getting made into lactate as it is with the cancer cell, the pyruvate is sent into the center of the mitochondria, the mitochondrial matrix, and it undergoes Krebs cycle. It gets converted into acetyl-CoA and undergoes the reaction of Krebs cycle. Krebs cycle is also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Um, and then the unique thing about that is when it goes through electron transport and oxidative phosphorylation to generate ATP and CO2, the CO2, carbon dioxide, is then released outside of the matrix, goes outside the cell, into the cytoplasm, and it goes outside of the cell, and then it gets taken back up with the red blood cells to the lungs. But here's the point. The carbon dioxide causes vasodilation in the area of the tissues that aerobically metabolize it. Well, if your cancer cell is not metabolizing things aerobically, that means it's not making this CO2. Therefore, it's not making this vasodilator CO2. Okay, And the CO2 also helps facilitate oxygen delivery to the tissues. So by not making CO2, the cancer is helping to maintain its hypoxic, um, acidic, local environment, local milieu. Um, so the cancer, in a sense, does all kinds of things to help itself to grow. And if you want to help prevent cancer, you want to do things that create the opposite situation. Avoid the fats. So you get more tissue oxygenation. Avoid the sodium chloride. So you get less acidosis. Eat things like fruits, which are alkaline, so you get less acidosis. Eat things like plant foods with potassium and magnesium, which are vasodilators, so you get more um, blood flow to the tissue. Um, exercise, so you get more oxygenation of the tissues. Um, so a low-fat, low-sodium, whole-food, plant-based diet creates a milieu that is more favorable for the normal cells, better oxygenation, more antioxidants. Okay. Um, what about stress, psychological stress in particular? You know, some stress in life is inevitable, and some of it's good. It energizes you to do the things you have to do. But excessive stress is harmful and increases cancer risk. And the metaphor for learning all the, fact, the features of stress is being chased by a tiger in the dark. But for our purposes, the big thing is stress is prothrombotic, meaning it increases the tendency of the blood, tendency of the blood to clot. It, this will increase atherosclerosis and contribute to tissue hypoxia. Stress increases blood clotting factors like fibrinogen, factor VIII antihemophilic factor, von Willebrand factor, and it also increases platelet activation. All of these things increase the tendency of the blood to clot. Platelet activation is thought to increase the risk of metastases by helping to shield some metastatic cancer cells from the immune system. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention on the previous slide was the local acidosis milieu, like the lactic acid, that impairs the function of immune cells, make them less able to remove the cancer cell. Okay, so this is a characteristic of cancer cells. They create favorable conditions for themselves to grow. Um, stress also increases cortisol, which suppresses immune function. Again, makes the immune system less able to protect the body from cancer. Stress also increases catecholamine hormones, and the catecholamines can function as siderophores, which means they can facilitate the transfer of iron to bacteria, which increases the risk of an infection uh, worsening, but it can potentially also do that to cancer cells. Cancer cells need iron to grow. Caffeine in coffee or tea or whatever is a, or energy drink, that's a stress equivalent. So I would recommend any cancer patient, no caffeine. I actually recommend anybody. Caffeine's not good for you. Sleep deprivation. Oh, and I'll give you an example of a typical lecture. I saw this guy. And this guy's a physician. He's giving a lecture about caffeine. And he keeps saying all these great things about caffeine. And I'm like, 
you know, that's an example. Somebody doesn't know what they're talking about. You know that caffeine increases blood pressure. You know, hypertension is not good for you. You know it increases cholesterol. Well, cholesterol elevation is not good for you. <laughs> you know it mimics the stress response. That's not good for you. It can cause insomnia. That's not good for you. So how could it be so good for you? So what I'm saying is a lot of people just parrot stuff they read. Like this guy, he was a physician giving this lecture. I couldn't believe it. But they don't really think about what they're talking about, and they don't know what they're talking about. All right, sleep deprivation, also a stress equivalent, really increases the same hormones. When I say something's a stress equivalent, I say it increases the same hormones, cortisol and catecholamines. Catecholamines are things like epinephrine, norepinephrine. They're also the same thing known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. Okay, what about milk, fish, and eggs, insulin, and mTOR? Okay, why does an animal why does animal protein cause tumor growth? Because you know we've got physiology like herbivores. The only time a herbivore eats animal protein is when it's a baby drinking the milk, and the purpose of that is to help that baby grow really fast. For most mammals, that's a key to survival. Uh, there's no animal that drinks milk after it's weaned. There's no animal that drinks milk from another species. Human breast milk is about five to six percent protein, and given that infancy is the most rapid time of growth, the rest of our lives we need significantly less than that amount of protein. I read somewhere it's in the ballpark of two and a half to five. Actually. We only need about 25 to 3% of proteins. That's, I, mean, I don't mean that to be 5. It's 25 to 3 was my understanding. Dr. McDougall has a good lecture on this. It's called his Protein Mastermind Lecture. And that's an important point. Uh, Kempner had patients for long amounts of time on 4% protein diets, and they did very well. Basically, it's impossible to be too low in protein unless you're starving to death. So don't worry about that. Um, the meat and the dairy cause an increase in growth hormone compounds, things like we talked about insulin with the fat, insulin-like growth factor, which is very much like insulin. They're both mitogenic and cause increased rates of cell growth and cell replication. Um, what about fish and eggs? All animal protein is about the same thing. It's animal muscle, therefore it's made out of protein and fat. Um, the fat's not good for you. We just spoke about that. The animal protein's not good for you either. That's the reason why there's no reason to eat meat or dairy. Um, animal protein also causes an elevation in blood cholesterol. Elevated blood cholesterol causes red blood cell rouleau sticking together, stack of coins, blood sludge, causes tissue hypoxia. It's not good for you. Um, let's see. Given that excess dietary fat increases mitochondrial dysfunction, leading to insulin resistance, which is going to lead to elevation of insulin levels in the blood, hyperinsulinemia, and then insulin is a mitogen, meaning that it stimulates mitosis, that's going to increase your risk of cancer. And there's, there's a lot of fantastic papers to show this. The Michael Brownlee paper that won the Banting Award in 2004 is great, called The Unifying Theory of Diabetes Complications. Gerald Sheldman is an MD-PhD researcher who confirmed with nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy that intramyocellular lipid is the first detectable finding in insulin resistance. Insulin resistance leads to high insulin levels, increases cancer risk. Okay, there's tons of other papers that support that, but those are the two of the best ones. The, the important point is dietary fat will cause increased insulin in the blood. What is the significance of increased insulin in the blood? Like I said, it's a mitogen, increases mitosis, causes cell growth and replication, increases cancer risk. So these are a couple different uh, growth factors right there. Your mTOR, your insulin, and your insulin-like growth factor. All of them are elevated by eating meat. Um, so that's one of the reasons why if I had cancer, what I would do, no meat, not one bite, no dairy, not one bite. What is the difference between animal protein and plant protein? Well, there's a couple differences, but the key ones for our purposes is animal protein has more methionine, which is essential for tumor growth, and it has more leucine, and leucine is a rate-limiting step for activation of mTOR. So what is mTOR? mTOR is mammalian target of rapamycin, sometimes called mechanistic target of rapamycin. It's a nutrient-sensing pathway, like a contractor getting ready to build a building. Before the contractor builds the building, he needs to have all the supplies so he knows that he's ready to build the building. Well, it tends to be the rate-limiting step having enough leucine available. Okay, so when leucine becomes available, mTOR will tend to be activated and it'll tend to promote cell growth and replication. And it's a tumor promoter when it's activated unnecessarily. Hyperinsulinemia also activates mTOR, so that's another thing that it does. What about soy? Well, first of all, what about beans? A couple points about beans. Beans have lots of protein. Out of all the common animal foods, they've got the highest protein in the ballpark of 25 to 29% protein. So I eat beans every day, and I like them. They're low in methionine, um, and they're considered one of the healthiest foods. You know, Dan Buettner's all his centenarian zones ate like a cup or so of beans every day, practically. Um, but nevertheless, if I did have proven, clinically proven cancer, I'd probably reduce my intake of beans. Even though no paper says that, I just would want to lower my intake of protein. 
even though it's plant protein and plant protein is not thought to do that. Me personally, that's what I would do. I'm not saying that that's definitely a research smartest thing to do, but that's what I would do. I would also minimize my intake of soy. I've never seen a paper saying you have to do that, but for my impression of reading about it, here's why I would do that. And also, I know some of the best doctors in the world and the most famous doctors think soy is this wonderful thing. Uh, but if you read, you know, there's differences of opinion. If you read Dr. McDougall's Start Solution, he's much less enthusiastic about soy than are a lot of other uh, nutrition experts. If you read Anthony Jay, he's a guy who wrote the book Estrogen Generation, Biochemistry PhD, he feels that soy is, is not something you should be eating. Um, and so why would I want to, I don't eat any soy anyways, none. But like, why would I be concerned about it? It's a very unique food. It's complicated. It increases levels of insulin-like growth factor. So insulin-like growth factor is associated with cancer growth. And I know it's been shown to not have anywhere near the effect of animal protein in a bunch of different studies, maybe even be protective. But still, it's increasing insulin-like growth factor. So you know, you got to be careful what you compare it to it. Just because it's not as bad as animal protein doesn't mean it's good, is the way my way of looking at it. It's sometimes associated with hypothyroidism, so it's potentially goitrogenic, okay? It also has estrogen-like effects, meaning it's estrogenic, okay? Um, it also has heme iron, okay? So it's got more potentially absorbable iron, is my understanding of it, than most other plants. And iron, high levels of increased iron, they increase your risk of cancer. So that's pretty worrisome. You got increased insulin-like growth factor, increased estrogenic effects, and increased iron effects. Um, so I, I'd be concerned about all those things. Now, some people say, well, the estrogens in soy are protective. And I am aware that there's a paper that says, well, they only activate the good estrogen receptors and not the bad estrogen receptors. But, you know, if you look at Anthony J to PhD, he went over that paper, and I looked at the paper myself, and the paper has an internal contradiction. In one part of the paper, it says soy only does the good thing. But in the other part of the paper, it implies that it does not. It, it activates the receptor you don't want, was my understanding of looking at that paper. Um, and then the other question I say to myself, why, why does soy even have estrogen? Does soy have breasts? Does soy have a uterus? What does soy need estrogen for? Um, it seems to me that, you know, estrogen is a birth control. What do you give as a birth control? A thinyl estradiol is what people take in human birth control pills quite often. So why would soy be making all this estrogen? It has tremendously high levels of estrogen, okay? And it seems to me, you know, maybe soy doesn't want to be eaten. And it's a chemical that it puts, uh into its leaves so or in its other components so that when a person eats it, they become infertile, that population or that animal, whatever it might be. That's how soy prevents itself from being eaten. And maybe that's why it also is associated with increased risk of hypothyroidism. It's not going to give me anything that I need, so why should I bother with it and take those risks? That's how I look at it. So here's a summary of the things that I would do. Low fat, low sodium, 100% whole food, 100% organic, vegan diet, no oil, no sweets, no alcohol, no caffeine. Um, to heal anything, you want better blood flow. This is the diet that provides best blood flow to the tissues. I would try to eat a lot of it raw, like raw fruits and vegetables. I think they're great. They're loaded with nutrients. and They're quite alkaline. Um, no added sodium because of vasoconstriction effects, potential metabolic acidosis effect. Um, no processed food, none whatsoever, none at all. Um, they're full of toxic preservatives, fat, MSG, which is potentially going to have harmful effects here. Herbicides and pesticides that have been shown to not be something you want to be putting into your body. Like I said, no alcohol, not one drop. No soda pop, not one drop. Soda pop contains sodium, phosphoric acid. Um, it's acidic, high fructose corn syrup, so you don't want it. No oils, not one drop of oil, and not any olive oil either, okay? Olive oil is unique. It's largely a MUFA, monounsaturated fatty acid. I would not want any of these things. I'd be worried about them causing weight gain, potentially insulin resistance, and other problems. I would avoid every single one of them, not one drop. No soy, like we just talked about. No meat, not one bite. No iron supplements. I don't want extra iron on board. It can contribute to increased oxidative stress, um, and it's required by, for cancer growth, so I wouldn't want to add any to my body. I'd go with the organic because it's got less herbicides and pesticides. The herbicides in non-organic food are routinely estrogenic, which potentially can worsen tumor growth, especially with breast cancer and with uh, prostate cancer and uh, endometrial cancer. 
A lot of pesticides are toxic to the mitochondria, so that's a good reason for wanting to minimize those. I would check my ferritin level, which is sort of an indicator of iron in the body. Not exactly, but it's a reasonable estimate of that. And if it was real high, I would donate blood to lower that. But if you're going to donate blood, be careful about it. Let your doctor know. Make sure you have no contraindications. And, um, you know, I would be well hydrated before doing it, so because you don't want to be hypotensive. I'd only donate the smallest amount of blood at a time. Um, what's the best water to drink? Ideally, well water with no fracking in the area. Test it first. Have a whole house carbon filter and a kitchen reverse osmosis filter. There's a lot of chemicals in water. We talked about it in other lectures, but to drink tap water, I think, is a bad idea. Okay, exercise a lot. Exercise gets your lymphatic flow in about 10 to 30 times faster. Improved lymphatic flow helps the immune system to function. Uh, when you sweat, you excrete a lot more toxins. Your sweat pores are like ways to get the toxic chemicals out of your body, the heavy metals out of your body. And a lot of the people who've had incredible recoveries that I've seen, like recovered from metastatic breast cancer and other cancers, they were running quite a bit. Some of them were running marathons, okay? I mean, that's a bit overdoing it, I think, but you want to be exercising a lot. Um, you get that lymphatic flow in and lets your immune system cells circulate all over the body, do their job. Humans are made to walk around all day looking for food. Get out in the sun. Sunshine gives you the activated form of vitamin D. It's a lot better for me. I don't take any of those pills. I don't, you, you know, you want to get your vitamin D from sunshine. So try to get some time outside to do that. You also get all this nitric oxide vasodilators from being out in the sunshine, and that increases blood flow to your tissues. You also get, there's effects from sunshine on mitochondria. That guy from MedCrim, Roger Seahole physician, he's like the pulmonologist, sleep certified guy. He's a smart guy. He has a really good lecture on the benefits of sunshine. Um, he's over at MedCram, this is a YouTube channel. Do at least one thing every day when you help other people because it's enjoyable and it lowers your stress levels, okay? Just helping other people, we're made to do that. And I think it's because something in our brain makes us feel like we're a more successful member of the group if we help others. And I don't know how to explain it, but you don't just make the other person happy, you make yourself happy. And something happens in your brain that makes you want to live more or your body say, yes, keep this person alive. I don't know, but it's true. If you just People just sit around by themselves, socially isolated, and don't interact with other people. They often get depressed and sort of spiral downward. Uh, positive social interactions are very good for us psychologically. Having some type of purpose in their life. Like 25 years ago, you know, we didn't know anything about this diet and nutrition to help my mom with her cancer. But she did so many positive things. She was like a, on a board of directors at an orphanage. She was like a, a tour guide at an art institute. She was a tour guide in a Franklin Wright architecture studio. She also, you know, played tennis. She adopted two girls for a while when their when their families were having problems and took care of them for a couple of years. They loved my mother like a her like that she was their mother. I mean, my mom was great. She's like the best person I ever met in my life. Uh, but I believe that's a big part of why she outsurvived her prediction on her cancer. And it bothered me that I wish I had known all this back then. I might have been able to save her and keep her alive. I've seen people with metastatic cancer that have survived 30 years that have done all these things. I wish very much that I had known that at the time. Uh, for some people, religion can have great psychological and emotional benefits and give them a sense of community, and that can be real helpful to them. Okay, one quick thing that I often see come up with patients and with friends is they sort of confuse social thinking and nutritional thinking. Just like humans have herbivore physiology, a big pack of animals eating grass or something, a lot of people think that way too. You know, social thinking tends to be linear and it tends to be things like everything in moderation, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. That's fine for social thinking, but it does not work for nutrition and health. Nutrition and health is sort of what I would call exponential thinking. There's a couple things I'm getting at. First of all, only eat things that are good for you. Nothing that's bad for you. Not one bite of anything bad for you. Number two, I'm talking about tumor receptors. You might have amplified um, tumor promoter receptors on a cancer cell, so it'll have, you know, 100 times or more uh, receptors for a tumor promoter than some other normal cell. So what I'm saying is small amounts of meat or oils or whatever, they might have a significant effect on inducing that cancer to grow. So don't give it any of them. Don't give it anything that's bad for you. The name of the game, from what I can tell about, you know, optimizing your diet and lifestyle for cancer reduction is avoid tumor promoters, which especially means um, the meat and the processed food and the estrogenic chemicals. Next, try to spend as much time as you can in PANS, parasympathetic autonomic, autonomic nervous system, like reducing your stress or doing things that you enjoy, a positive stress. 
and then live a purposeful life. That purposeful life while you're helping other people and doing something good or creating something nice, doing something significantly positive. It just makes you happier, makes others happier, and, and everything just goes better for all involved. Okay, this is just a quick picture showing an example of a good food like potatoes. Only about 1% of the calories from fat. Great. You're going to have good oxygenation in your tissues. The amount of protein, I actually think it's actually a little lower than this number. White rice is also good, but there's the issue with the arsenic. We've talked about that. Here's look at the beans. 25% of calories from protein. Soy, 29% calories from protein. 37% in that ballpark about from fat. That's a lot of fat. Look at blueberries, how nice they are. Hardly any fat. Very low in protein. Um, they're good. Okay. Um, Here's some references. Um, if you want, you can look up any of this stuff here. Uh, there's all kinds of good stuff. So anyways, I hope that was helpful for you. And again, that's just what I would do. It's up to the individual.